Now I'd like to introduce our next speaker, Chris Martinson. Chris is an independent economic researcher, futurist, and the author and creator of The Crash Course, The Unsustainable Future of the Economy, Energy, and the Environment. He is also a fellow of the Post Carbon Institute. Chris earned his PhD in neurotoxology from Duke University and MBA from Cornell University. He's here to discuss why the next 20 years will look very different from the last 20, how trends in the economy and energy will shape immigration, population, and environmental issues. Ladies and gentlemen, Chris Martinson. Thank you. You know, I, I could have I listened to Paul for two and a half hours. Um, it, I can't believe I have to follow that act. You know, I've heard it come up a lot over the past couple of days. Uh, you know, what is the way to galvanize uh, action? And I chose a number of years ago that the way I was going to try and, and wake people up to what I saw as a looming, converging set of very serious challenges was to use the economy as one of the main levers. And, and so I started there as a strategy, but the more I dug in, the more it became you know, a, a very fruitful place to dig all on its own. Led to a number of other places of inquiry, and ultimately I rediscovered stuff that people had already learned decades ago, but I wasn't smart enough to read them first. Um, and what I came up with is, is a point of view about the future. And that's what I want to talk to you about today. And, and this is a very interesting sort of a, a, another discussion we could have is about how it is you go about actually leading people to change. I have close to 4,000 emails now from people who've told me that they've done everything from changed jobs, sold homes, moved to different places, not had children on the basis of this information that I'm partly going to share with you right now. Uh, it's a large body, so I can't possibly get it all out in 30 minutes. And I was able to have that impact because I discovered something about three years ago through the School of Hard Knocks that I was not in the business of sharing information. I was very unhappy up to that point because I had this really incredible stuff and I wanted people to listen. And it just didn't seem to be effective. And three years ago I had this blinding insight that what I was actually doing, well, I was in the business of challenging beliefs. And that brings us into the realm of emotion. So what I'm going to share with you today is some of that basic information, but I want you to understand that it's not what you say, it's how you say it that I've discovered is the most important thing in all of this. And understanding that particularly in any charged field, like population or immigration, you're up against beliefs. You're not up against a dearth of information, which Paul uh, just made, I think, abundantly clear. So. The primary thing that I do is I raise awareness, and it's with this thing called the Crash Course. You can go and you can see it online. It's, I made it freely available. Probably the best work I ever did in my life. Um, it's about 20 chapters, three and a half hours, and it's uh, coming out in a book shortly um, in uh, this spring from Wiley and Son. So people who don't like things on computers will be able to um, read it. And what this thing does, the Crash Course, is it, it takes the economy and starts here. This is something I, I feel needs to be better appreciated in this crowd and all other crowds that I've, I've been speaking to lately is that the economy is not something we can take for granted. It's always been there, yes, it's true, but it's been relying on certain things that I'm going to now explore in the next few minutes that I think reasonable people, prudent adults, ought to at least consider that we have some very serious challenges on our, uh, to our economy, how it functions, how it's organized. And you can, you know, the economy is how we organize ourselves. This is how we get things done. This is, you know, we have, if anything we hope for technologically or sociologically requires us to have a functioning intact, complex economy. But I could give you all the money in the world and I could put you on a desert rock in the middle of the ocean and if you don't have energy, you still have nothing. Energy, as Julian Simon said, is the master resource. All else follows from that. So we're going to focus on energy a little bit, and I'm also going to take a quick tour today through the environment, which for me uh, it today is going to be about resources. I believe Don Whedon's going to do a, a, a wonderful job with species. So I'm just going to look at resources here very quickly today. And the whole crash course summarizes to this, this one statement right here, that the next 20 years are going to be completely unlike the last 20 years. And that's really important because as humans, we tend to expect, make our expectations around the future based on what just happened. So if the road's going along really straight, you can nod off and probably wake up and you're still, you know, you're going to be all right on this, right? The problem comes in if there's a sharp corner in the road. I believe that we have a very sharp corner coming and whether I'm right or wrong, at least I think you should pay attention to and either dismiss or refute or uh, reject, but at least look at, at the arguments that I have to lay out. Um, and so everything sort of starts here for me. 
it starts with uh, how economists, I know Paul talked about economists he's working with, but all conventional economics at this point in time, whether you're a, a Keynesian uh, uh, from the school of Hayek or you're from any of the other branches, all, oh, let me simplify that for you. <laughs> That's a formula for growth. And not just any growth, right? This is the kind of growth we come to expect in our economy. Not just expect, but require. Not like a law saying it's required. Require like my body requires oxygen. With growth, our economy does reasonably well. Without growth, it has some issues. 2009, the world GDP shrank by 2%, and it felt like our financial system, the wheel fell off that cart, it went into a ditch, it caught on fire, and then the ditch slumped over a cliff. I mean, it was awful. And that was what happens with minus 2% growth. Plus 2%, we wouldn't be having the same sense of urgency around this. That's what I mean by require. It, our economy is really functioned to, to grow. And it all starts with this idea of money, money itself. And I don't care what color your money is. I don't care whose picture's on it. I don't care about any of these things. The IMF uh, and the World Bank together have said, if you want to be part of the international community, meaning if you want to trade, your money has to share some characteristics with ours. And that one characteristic is there's only one thing they really care about, and it's this. You can do your, whatever you want with your money, but you have to loan it into existence. That's sort of the base requirement. All money is loaned into existence. So think about that for a second. What it means is that when Bill Gates takes his $40 billion of wealth, puts it off in an interest-bearing account at 5%, and earns $2 billion on that, where'd that $2 billion come from? Well, I can tell you right now, it's that $2 billion of income for Bill Gates in that situation is $2 billion in loans that somebody else had to take out. There is no other mechanism by which money comes into creation. And so it leads to a, a key concept of the crash course, you know, say that all this money is loaned into existence. It, it has this one feature that we can just describe without saying whether it's good or bad or any of that. At any one point in time, there's always more debt in a society that has a debt-based money system then there is money. It's just a feature. So if you like data, consider that right now there's $52 trillion in total credit market debt in the US, 52. And there's about 14 trillion of money. So you, know, you can start to see there's a difficulty in maybe lining those concepts up. Um, if you ever wanted to pay it all back, it, it gets a little bit tricky. But what it leads to is this concept here, that perpetual growth then becomes a requirement of our modern banking system. And that's just a feature that it happens to have. So, okay, so we hold that feature off to the side, and we want to ask some questions about, well, what does that look like? What does it mean? What are the implications of that? Because it does have some really powerful implications. The first is I want to toss up a chart here. This is looking at debt to GDP, so it's a ratio. That left axis is in percent. So if you see a number like 200, it means there's twice as much debt as GDP. And we start all the way on the left in 1925 and can go through uh, about 2008 in this chart. Now, yeah, there's a little bump here um, that actually starts in 1929. And it starts not because we started really piling on the debt at the beginning of the Great Depression. It's rather that the GDP fell away from under this particular ratio. Otherwise, that's an anomaly. Our country had always maintained a ratio of debt to income, because that's what GDP really is, your income, of less than 200%. And then somewhere in the early 80s, we completely and utterly changed our relationship to debt. So when I say the next 20 years is going to be only like the last 20 years, in order for it to look like the last 20 years, that yellow line has to continue up uninterrupted in the same trajectory. You and I and everybody in this room basically formed our adult impressions about how the economy works while situated on that line that's sloping up at about 40 degrees. And we've been there so long it looks like level horizon to us. Now what is debt though? What really is debt? It's one very important thing about debt. Yeah, it's got this principal component, it's got interest, there's all different forms. It's a claim on future money. That's all it is. So when we go into debt, what we're really doing is taking, it's like boring a hole into the future and pulling consumption back or, or taking prosperity from the future, spending it today. But when we get there, and we will eventually, we're going to have to repay that debt. Yeah, you can default on it too, but for a country that imports two-thirds of its uh, energy needs, defaulting is not a realistic option. Um, it, it's something that we just have to deal with. And this isn't just a U.S. story. I, I have to tell this story all over the world now. Um, here in the blue is the official net debt. Those are the comforting things we read about in the paper, like, oh, the U.S. debt isn't as bad as, as Japan's at this point. Those are the little blue ones. The green includes what we call off-balance sheet. Those are the entitlements. That's Social Security. These are the liabilities, but they're not strictly debt. 
but it really is the debt of the nation because whether you choose to pay your elderly people their promised entitlement payments or not, somebody's going to have to eat that cost, either so cost on one side or, or another. So it really is truly a global phenomenon, and we do not have any historical period anywhere in the record where any country has ever dug out for more than 260% of debt to GDP, and it happened once. It happened once from 1815 to about 1890 in England, after they had gone through the Napoleonic Wars, they had this Corsican upstart they had to deal with, and they did pay that down. But it's important to remember that A, they were able to turn off their war expenditures, just like you know, there was no structural component, they just flipped those off, the people went back to the farms, and uh, they had this thing called the Industrial Revolution fire up, which helped them pay for it. So if we've got an Industrial Revolution, you know, version 2.0, uh, this will be a really great thing to, to sort of discover very soon. So I can simplify our economy with just two words. It doesn't have to be all that complicated. Our economy must grow in order to be happy. I mean, not must. Again, it's not a legal requirement. Now, if you really think through the implications of that, that it must grow, I mean, that's enough. You know, you can, you can scare primates with that story, right? <laughs> it's, it's actually a frightening concept. All right, so how do you grow? all economic growth requires energy. The relationships are incredibly tight. In particular, oil is really essential. So is electricity, but oil is, is one of the prime ways in which um, uh, we grow an economy. And we have all kinds of data that I'm not going to show you that, that shows how tight the relationship is. So here's, we're looking at energy use here across the globe from 1800 through till about 2008 or 9, I think, is when this chart was put together. And what we can see is that it sort of had a straight portion there and it has a very different sort of a curve or slope to the thing here. We've been using energy at ever increasing rates. And in particular, when you think back to that chart I showed you, in the, you know, from the, the growth in debt, the growth in energy use and growth in debt, they were just went hand in hand. So two assumptions were being made there at the same time together, that both the debt and the energy were making the same assumption um, together, and that's that the future was going to continue to look just like that. Now, if we look at the U.S. situation, this is a chart of, of oil production from the United States. Starts in 1920, goes through to about 19, uh, this chart ends in about 2000 or so. Doesn't matter because all I want to point out is that the United States went through a peak in production in 1970. And this is no longer, you know, this is not a theory, this is not something that, you know, we're arguing about. This is just a fact, it's an observation, and it's about 40 plus years old at this point in time. So, and, and this is not a, a failure of will, you know, the United States has dug lots and lots of holes um, all over the place. And, uh, and we think we pretty much know where all the oil is. We import the difference, of course. We import about two-thirds of our liquid fuel needs on a daily basis from a whole range of countries. Um, and that just happens to be the reality of the situation right now. And uh, you have to find oil before you can produce it. The United States peaked its discoveries in about 1930. Forty years later, we had a peak of actual production. World discoveries peaked in 1964. This is not a matter of conjecture. This is not evil oil companies hiding data from us. The fact of the matter is that we peaked out in oil discoveries in 1964. Add 40 years to that, you end up around 2004, give or take, you know, and, uh, and that's very close to where we think the actual peak of what we might call conventional oil happens to be.